let me welcome you one and all and also say happy new year and happy new year to a new round not another round but a new very sober round of Danish books that we'll be reading in the spring. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to see so many people showing up for such a long, complicated book that we've read this time. But of course, I want to thank Mary Delorme from Scan Design and Lina from Northwest Danish Association so much for their help in this. And then I also really want to point out that we've made a change in our arrangements so that we are now doing the author talk or expert interview before the book. And if you have not listened to Desiree Orbeck's interview with Carsten Jensen, you are missing out. So please, you know, just do it, just enjoy it. I must admit I'm a knitter, so I sit there and listen and knit very happily and totally enjoyed it. He is such a wonderful man. He's also visited us in the book club in Madison. We have a Danish book club in Madison. And we were reading We the Drowned for that book club. And he was telling us some of the fascinating stories that he's also sharing in this interview with Desiree, among others, how he moved to the city of Mastel on Eru and kind of settled there, invited the locals to come and share their stories. And he said, I can't guarantee you'll be in the book, but tell me your stories and I'll incorporate them. So he did that. Um, oh, and Lina, would you answer Nate in the chat? Is there a link to the interview? I would be very interested in watching it. Yeah. I know you can send it out right away. Yeah, and so he was talking to all the locals and really enjoying their input while he wrote this book, which took him five years, the whole process. And of course, as you know, it's a book of 740 pages, uh, depending on whether you're reading or which edition you're reading. I must admit, I read, I read it both in English and Danish, but I reread it in Danish this time for the simple, simple reason that, and I'm going to show you proudly, my dedication from the author. Oh. <laughs> and he, he says, to Nita, with thank you for an inspiring evening in the best Danish book club in Madison. So <laughs> he couldn't have said it better, right? So that was uh, wonderful. And uh, he's a very, very amazing man. He has since written other books. And I especially want to point out that he's written a book about grief because in uh, actually during his visit in Madison, his stepson died very unexpectedly at 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And that inspired Carsten Jensen to write essays and thoughts and philosophize about the concept of grief. He had to, and the stepson died in Africa. So it was a very traumatic experience. His mom was not there. His stepdad, Carsten, was not there. And so uh, if you're interested in his writing and like his writing, then do look at that book as well. And Desiree, welcome. I've already praised you for your amazing interview. Thank you so much. And for the fact that it's available before we even start talking about the book. I apologize, right. I'm a little late. Um, I had some technical issues, so thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you're here. So what I'd like to do today is hope that you all have a lot to say. As you know, it's such a rich book and it has so many themes. So when I was trying to put together the questions or whatever you want to call them, the thoughts, uh, I was swimming and almost felt I was drowning as well. So it's a very apt metaphor for this book. You can drown in it. There's so much to talk about. So I would like to, as I've done before, just start with a little quote and then open up to everyone and anyone and please 
join in. I'm sure you have thoughts to share. And you can also, this is one thing I thought about, you can also tell us who your favorite character is. Mm. So, you know, we have many ways we can start this, but I'd like to start with a quote. And it's from the Danish version, page 232, in um, uh, the section where we're talking about what I would call the main protagonist, Albert. He says, we don't sail because there is an ocean, but because there is a harbor. We don't look for far away uh, destinations first. First and foremost, we're looking for protection. I think this is an amazing quote because he also at some point talks about everybody needing a yardstick in their lives. So we need goals, we need a yardstick. And of course, for me, one of the huge questions in this book is, why do they do it? Why do they sail? Why are they so enamored by this life of danger and death? Death is ubiquitous in the book. Why do they persevere? Why is that their life? And of course, one thing that I also you know, want to throw at you is the fact that he repeatedly talks about in the book how the graveyard contains women and children. The men do not return. They stay out there and they don't come back. So with that quote about why we're sailing, not because there's an ocean, but because there's a harbor, I would like to open up the discussion and let me hear what you have to say, what you would like to discuss, and whether you want to talk about why they sail or, you know, that huge question for me. And you can raise your hand or you can just start talking. You can do whatever you feel comfortable doing in this context. Um, I'm happy to have just one comment. You know, I certainly don't have a total answer to this, but, you know, at the very beginning, when we meet the young students and their teacher. It's a very kind of brutal beginning, in my opinion, to this story. But what it eventually is saying is that this harshness of life to which they were born in this island, the, the um, harshness in which the teacher treated them, it was, he was preparing them for their life at sea. He wasn't preparing them necessarily for mathematics or writing or literature. Uh, the idea comes across that um, this is the life we are born to. This is the life that we are prepared to, uh, we are prepared for. And this is the life of our fathers. And so in some ways, at least in one component of the book, it is not why do we sail? It is we sail because that is the life those are the stories. This is the tradition of our people in one, one sense. And yet, Khan Margarita, can I ask you, um, I'm a teacher. I've yeah. never hit any students. <laughs> How, <Yes. laughs> and I probably won't, but um, how does this violence, how is it justified? And doesn't violence beget violence? Because I feel as if in the book, yes, they learn a valuable lesson. Henshion comes back and says, it's the same when you start um, sailing. Lorenz comes back and says the same. Everybody beats you up. So yes, we know that those were the conditions in those days and they definitely were hardened by this teacher but he was, in my mind, an evil, vicious, um, sadistic person. And preparing children for that, that kind of life, doesn't that make them evil and vicious and sadistic? As it says about Knul Eik and the, the other protagonist, um, he developed hate 
what he learned was to hate because of beatings on board. To me, that was a thread from the get-go because I thought it did beget more, more Haiti and more violence. And it just seemed to carry through the book that, you know, this is where we started. This is how we learned. And the fact that you'd think you could get out of school and move on, but then it was even worse uh, on board, more hitting, more violence. And it just, I'm a retired teacher and I would never hit a child. So it was hard for me. So maybe I, I can butt in here. Um, Albert talks about uh, trying to overcome the violence. And we have a fine example of it in the book where mm -hmm. instead of, the, they have this um, uh, uh, first mate who is after them all the time. I think he has a Scottish name, McCalvero. I don't remember his name. O'Connor. Yeah, O'Connor. Yeah, O'Connor it is, that's right. And, and uh, instead of killing him, they decided to not kill him and to take him to court. And I think that's a, a beautiful part of the book where where uh, Carsten Jensen uh, gives the op the example of the opposite, and where he where they they uh, go through all the agony of trying to get justice. It's a lot easier to live by violence than it is to live by justice, and mm -hmm. I think that's part of the 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 the, the book's uh, theme as well. You, you can actually live a peaceful life, and you can live a good life. But it's much harder uh, mm. because it requires you to hold back and it requires you to uh, find uh, middle grounds and all that kind of difficult, difficult stuff. So I, I, I really enjoyed that little piece of it. And I sat in suspense. What are they going to do uh, to O'Connor? And, and, and how are they going to? Uh, overcome that kind of, of, of attitude. And, and it was so beautifully described there. Yeah. Still comment. No, and I think you're right, Otto, because as it says, leading up to that trial, O'Connor does everything in his power to get them to run, to get them to desert the ship and leave yeah. so that they are the culprits. But Albert is smart enough to turn the turn kind of turn it around so that he becomes the one who's on trial instead of them just leaving because they can't stand the conditions anymore but again it's a hardship right so even like you like you say and I want to repeat that it's so hard it would have been a lot easier had they all ganged up on him and killed him okay can we just go back to Isaacson the teacher remember <laughs> when they have him on the floor and they have his arm twisted behind his back. And they say, the we narrator says, we could have taken him, but we didn't. Why not? Yeah. I think, Nita, that they, they didn't take him because they feared the repercussions of doing that. And I have to agree that even though I wanted them to get revenge on him for his, his sadistic behavior, I didn't really think there was any way they could do it. And I didn't really like what happened in that whole part yeah. where they, they tortured the dog and they set fire to his house and his wife went nuts. And I, I thought all of that just turned out rather badly. What, what kind of repercussions would you perceive there to be, Heidi? Uh, if, they, if they had, for example, beaten him to a pulp, <laughs> like, like he was trying to do to them, what do you think would have happened? Because the women, it said very specifically, you know, that's one of the questions about the women's role. The women were in the face of authority, the priest and the teacher, completely <laughs> silent and meek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what kind of repercussions do you think? I, I can't remember what was said in the book as a justification for not 
going forward with um, that situation where he had his arm twisted behind his back because they certainly didn't stop trying to get back at him. But I think they were, they were just concerned about their parents' response and other people in the community. And they would just maybe be beaten anyway by someone else. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really certain, but. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's right. They say he's an adult. And I did ask all of you to think about one of the sentences, adults are the natural enemies of children. <laughs> he says that in the book. Yeah. And that is again, Knudia, who's ruminating. I can't, I can't ask anybody for help. It's, it's not what you do. You just figure it out for yourself because adults are the natural enemies of children. I found, I found a sentence that I thought was interesting. Life had taught him about, this is Albert, life had taught him uh, something far more complicated than justice, and its name was balance. Mm -hmm. mm. That's, a, that's a good theme. Let's, let's go to that. How do we achieve balance? And would you say, after reading the book, is there a balance? Do we have victims that are always victimized? Is there balance? And think about all those interactions. Think about Clara Fries and her son. Is there balance between them? Clara Fries and Albert, is there balance between them? And the old sail ship, the new uh, steel ship and, and steamers, any balance? Is there any balance achieved? Of course, from the war in 1848, through World War I to World War II, is there any balance achieved in the book? It is a huge question. For me, no, I don't see, there is always this um, going back and forth. The, the sea and the ship, the change from sailing to steam, the women that want the men, why, why do you go sail? What they are questioning that as, as well as times are changing after World War I. Why are you sailing? Why don't we change this? Um, so I think the balance eventually comes within the heart or the soul of the individual who finds their balance within life on that journey, whether it is at sea, or whether it is in the harbor, whether it is the young man who was so constantly picked on when he was young, I forget his name, I believe Lawrence, Lawrence, uh, mm -hmm. who then in his old age finds a place for himself. I, I, that would be my look at that balance because it doesn't come necessarily with nature or culture or history or war it, but it comes with each individual and how they perceive their path that's just my thought mm. Nate can you hear me okay yes okay good I've got I've got a, I'm a little under the weather so I'm sorry if my voice is a little <laughs> a little rough um anyway this is wonderful um I Joan, if you have the page number to that quote, I would be very interested in um, it's knowing right that. At the, the very end of 228. 228, wonderful. I was going to pick up on your comment, Joan, about, um, and return back to the idea of violence, Neda, in terms of the balance. It seems to me that violence is pervasive uh, from beginning to end in the novel. And Albert and Kla represent two very different reactions or relationships to this pervasiveness of violence. Kla seems to, to want to control. In fact, the wonderful figure is she sees herself as a Xerxes whipping the seas, uh, beating them in order to protect Marstal from, from this violence that's come to them through shipping, through their maritime existence as a port. Where Albert seems to be more than happy to kind of court that sense of violence as part of the upbringing of, of the city, right? Is that you you kind of pay your dues um, sailing on ships and then you return home, uh, but Clara rejects that. And so I think there's this kind of interesting attempt, the balance there is somewhere between Clara's kind of refusal um, of the violence that's pervasive and Albert's maybe his kind of willingness to let it 
exist. And so I, I to me, I, I, there's some struggle for balance. I'm not sure whether it's achieved or not in the end. I think there's something there. <clears throat> that, that's right. And, and I would like to add, Nate, that um, if you look at the relationship between Clara and uh, Albert, he definitely is unable to achieve and accept the balance that she is offering him. Yeah, I think that's, that's a right. Very, very interesting question. Why is he so alienated from this concept of balance? We have Desiree, Linda, and Lori waiting. Desiree. Yeah, I think, of course, there is a lot of imbalance uh, between uh, kids and adults and uh, farm workers and seamen and in uh, terms of gender, I'm thinking maybe the imbalance also um, could be seen. I, I didn't talk to Kasten about this and I didn't think about it before. So thank you, Nader, for bringing this to my attention. Um, the imbalance between the sea and the people living by the sea, at the sea, from the sea. Um, because in the beginning, the sea has the upper hand and is completely influencing people's lives and destinies and happiness and sorrows. But by the end, um, maybe because of a woman, maybe because of a war, maybe it's one of the same thing. Um, the imbalance is lessened, I would say. Um, and because of that, the imbalance between people within the community will also change. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In what way, Desiree, so that they all become more earthbound uh, or seabound, or how do you see them changing? Well, for one, there will be fathers and brothers and uncles and grandparents around, so that maybe the violence will be lessened. Maybe we won't have a priest and a teacher um, determining what kind of uh, way we want to raise our young boys. Um, Maybe there will be more balance in the relationship between man and wife. Uh, maybe the, the whole connectivity within this master city will change. And because of that, the balance will change. And because of that, the whole um, way we think about community and sense of belonging and the sea, maybe the balance will change like throughout all the levels. I don't know, I haven't thought too hard about this, but I think it's it's um, it's interesting because then again, it would tie the whole, like this uh, book about what the sea does to a community, what what both the, the on the micro and micro level out in the world, but also in this small city, like the sea play had, it's almost as if the sea has this role as a, a, not a, a character in the book, or a determining factor of all the characters, at least. Yeah. Thanks. Linda? Well, this is taking it, maybe not where this discussion has gone, but I feel that uh, Jensen is not only talking about balance as we have been, but also the idea of good and evil. And to me, the most evil person in the book, of course, was Herman. Yet, he managed to bring the good of a community aboard the boat so that he was loved there. So I think throughout the book, you know, the image to me is the tides coming and the tides going, the in, the out, the yin, the yang. And yeah, there's a balance through the book, even to the point of the good and evil with the characters. Mm -hmm. So even though he is such an evil character and a murderer, not just of a man, but of a seagull, you know, Tordenskjot, I mean, it's horrible. Um, the fact that he's amputated, he has both legs missing and an arm, is that an appropriate punishment to bring balance to his evil, do you think, Linda? No, well, I'm not a judge, I don't know. <laughs> no. Kill, I, my, my attitude is kill them all, let God sort them out, but. No, I, I can't answer that. No, but it's an interesting metaphor, yeah. uh, Carson. It's I, I understand that's where it was going, yeah. Yeah, that he does amputate him to such an extent that it's as if, okay, he's a core now, and he's no longer a core of evil as he was in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Linda, yeah. What about you, Laurie? I found myself thinking about um, 
the male spaces out on the on the ships and the ocean and that wider world that didn't have any connection to home and then the uh the, the land the I'm on the verge of the sea on the side of the sea which is a very female space and i also wondered he didn't he there's not a lot of female voices in this book um but there have to be some women in that community who are really glad to see them go it would be like, oh, phew, I'm not going to get beat up or pregnant for the next three years. Awesome. You know, and, um, and if he doesn't come back, ah, there's another one. Um, and, you know, the, I understood what she was trying to do um, by just, just, you know, switching the system. It was, but it's, it's almost like if you bring home if, if all these men become earthbound, become town bound, and they lose their ships, they lose their ability to go out in the water, they're still carrying with them so many generations of violence. Um, and just clearly just having your feet on the land is, is not going to make that go away. Um, what I really found myself, I mean, I love this book, I have to say, I just, just loved it. Um, it was such a pleasure to, I didn't even realize how many pages I had I read it was delightful but now I would love to see him have a similar treatment with a farming community mm -hmm. and I, I if you haven't listened to the interview I highly recommend it because he said some very interesting things about you know that 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 from his perspective that uh, Danes who grew up in this in the the communities that are on the on the water with a lot of people going in and out to different places in the world, like most kinds of port cities tend to be open to ideas and, and new cultures and things like that. And the way he was framing it, you know, farmers are more suspicious, probably more conservative, um, uh, living maybe a little bit more fear-based in a different kind of way because, you know, really things happen. And um, so now I want him to do a book about the farm. <laughs> No, I think I think that's a very good point, Laurie, because traditionally in Denmark, the farmers have been the richer communities, so they've been well off, so they haven't had to risk their lives going out as seamen or sailors or fishermen or whatever, and they have been the poorer uh, people. If you think of Eero as a very small island, there isn't that much farming land, so it's pretty clear why they would have to have such huge communities of sailors going out. Uh, trying to to make a living. But I like your point. However, I also was thinking along the same lines, what do the women live off when their husbands are gone? They don't have any income necessarily. What kind of jobs would they have? They would have, uh, you know, maybe a handful of kids. What would they do? Yes, uh, garden, you know, where they could uh, grow their vegetables and so on and maybe kids who could go fishing, but it would be a difficult life, even if they were happy and relieved not to have a, a maybe a very bullying husband um, in the bed next door. Uh, so I think that he also manages to convey the hardship, both of the men and of the women who were strong when it came to surviving, but not strong when it came to any kind of mental authority neither over their kids preventing them from sailing or towards the authorities in the town so that, that's a very very good point for what the women did for money it said that almost everyone in the town had invested in a ship even even maids had a small mm -hmm. you know investment and when those ships would come back in everyone would get a small amount so maybe that's where some of their income came from that's what you're you're thinking, yeah. Because what else could it be? Almost. Yeah. No, I was just following up on what Lori was saying when she was talking about that uh, look at the farmer versus the sailor. And Albert has that conversation with one of the farmers who basically says, "Well, we we are of the land. We are, you know, we are more of Marstel and El, uh, where you go and leave." And he said, "Ah, yes, but you know, we always come home." And when there was the immigration to the states, who was in line to sail away, it was the farmers. And I, I thought that was just an interesting look. And, and again, that 
that idea of balance between these these two communities. Yeah. And if you want to continue along that line, do you remember the conversation between Elbert and I think it was Elbert um, and um, Colonel? Who said, or a general or an admiral who said, we need war because it's good for the country, it's good for the people. And Albert said, but uh, what about all the dead? And that didn't really figure into that uh, very, very rosy picture of, oh, we are such a strong seafaring nation. And of course, if you look back at the time that Masta had, what, 346 ships and was second in size only to Copenhagen, that was the pride. So much more obvious than the farmer's pride in their land, which was, you know, which was a lot more kind of subdued because they were the sailors and they were known all around the world for being great sailors. That was their image. So that, that is a very interesting contrast that you brought up here in, in the name of balance. Let's Let's move on if you're okay with that. Let's move on and talk about death as the theme. Apart from what Lori said about somebody not really minding if her husband didn't come home, I thought that what he starts with is a very graphic description of the War of 1848. It then, for my kind of from my perspective, turned incredibly more graphic and painful when you were reading about World War II because of technology and what was happening with the submarines and of course also the airplanes bombing the ships. How do you see death as a part of life in this book? Can we put that on the parameter of balance also or is death simply too overwhelming a companion for everybody? And notice the first death we hear about is Tenjiran. I mean, after the war, when we, 1848, and we kind of get back into Mostet and Tenjiran, oh yeah, he sank uh, with that ship and he was 15 years old, end of him. And that very matter of fact approach to death. Do you think that that was Kostyansen's, uh, well, was it his goal to give us that balance in life and death, the minister can't really do anything, can't really comfort. And when it comes to bringing the messages of dead family members, he can't even do it. He's relying on Elbot and Emilia um, Rasmussen, the, the widow of the painter. The minister, obviously religion, is no good. How do you deal with death if you are in this kind of community? And of course, with this kind of community, I also want to stretch it out and say he is painting a picture of us and the world and life and death and so on. Did anybody think about that? I did. I have a quote that I'd like to share with you. That's from, I don't know, maybe the first third of the book that I thought was really significant. It says, life was like one big marching army. Death ran alongside and picked off a soldier here and there, but that didn't affect the army. Its march continued and its size didn't seem to diminish. So, and then I'm skipping a little bit. Such was the chain of life, unbreakable. So I would, I guess, I thought that was interesting, an interesting way to look at life and death. And it came up in the context of whether or not it was fair if, Fair, fairness as, a, as part of death. If a child died early, people might say, oh, that was so unfair if they died at a young age. But the author seemed to be, or whoever the, the, was um, asserting ideas, because it was often this we kind of a mm -hmm. voice, um, just seemed like there was some recognition of like a personification of, of life and death and what the relationship was like. To me, it seemed very matter of fact, and that's why Albert could go and make the calls when the minister couldn't. 
And that's mm -hmm. why when the young boy asked about drowning and what is it like to drown and how do you drown and how do you feel? He didn't sugarcoat it. It was a matter of fact, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was interesting to see someone face it straightforward. And without jumping the gun, can I ask, who do you think the we is that Heidi is talking about? Who is the narrative we? And how do you explain the ending of the book where everybody's dancing? And again, let me get it. Uh, but tonight we were dancing with the drowned and they were us. How did you yes, see the we? Part, the we. <laughs> The we and the dancing and are we all drowning? Are we all drowned? What is he trying to tell us? Yeah, I think in life we're all drowning and at the end we die and we're dead. But to me in the, the book, there was an element, first of all, with Lawrence's boots. That was the first hint that, okay, there's magic realism here. And then at the end, yes, yes, we came out and everyone was together. And then it made me think, that this is definitely not just a snapshot of an island, but it's a universal theme. And I felt that, uh, that I began to reflect back on the book and where was it? So that yes, yes, we're all drowning until we drown. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, what do you get in life? Do you get what you deserve? No, you get what you get. Nate? <laughs> <No. laughs> I think this is a really interesting question about who this we is. I paid attention to this and it actually shifts throughout the novel. The we is never um, just simply everyone or simply Marstal. Uh, it's, it's always, uh, you kind of have to read between the lines and figure out who the we is from time to time. But I do think that Jensen is kind of moving in that direction of this kind of gradually collectivizing going on in which everyone becomes included at the end. But it's it's interesting. This is a very odd um, narratological technique. Usually authors will write in a first person singular and to use a first person plural protagonist is a really strange thing. I mean, there's not a lot of writers who do this. It was popular in the, in the 30s with some Marxist writers. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's really remarkable that Jensen chooses this kind of technique. Um, and it really, I think it's wonderful the way he flits back and forth between single protagonists and this collective we protagonist. There's this kind of fun, interesting tension between both of those you know, throughout, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, any other comments on the we? Um, I, I'll follow up with what Nate said. I found it very confusing in the beginning to figure out what the perspective was because we kept hearing about this collection of boys who traveled around and did things. And, and it seemed to shift between which boy was telling the story. So I kept thinking, is this an observer just telling me or is it actually one of the boys who's talking? And that lasted for a long time until I could finally figure out who the narrator was. And, and I'm not sure how that changed my perception of the book, but I think it, it at first it found it hard, I, I found it hard to get into the book. Can I just say to, to you, Mary, that I think it's a really good observation if we think of the games of boys in Mostad, mm -hmm. also the fact that they were, okay, let's look for some farm boys that we can beat up now because we're frustrated. Uh, but the, the feeling of community that they created because they were always facing external enemies that also creates a we in, okay. in a way yeah mm -hmm. Desiree? yeah i um for those of you who listened to the interview you will know that i asked uh, Kasten about this because i was like sometimes we are like listening to the gossip within the women sometimes we are amongst the boys who of following this mean teacher. Sometimes we are at sea and this is going on for like 150 years. Who is this we person or what is this we? And what he said was that he had struggled a lot with his narrating voice. And obviously he couldn't have one narrator that would last for the entire 150 years. Um, 
but it was so it's it, it was like a yeah a, a literary grip or tool that he wanted to use and also I think he wants he didn't say this but I think he wants to make sure he keeps us engaged and mm -hmm. keeps I like I lo I was like am I reading this wrong and is there something I don't get here did I did I miss something? Like I was starting to questioning myself and my reading abilities. And I think that's deliberate on his part. Mm -hmm. Like he wants to engage us. He wants to make us come constantly wonder and like, are you with me? Because I am, I have a plan here, but also he's, he's very good when he, like he has so many thoughts, right? But the we is tied into that togetherness and how everything ties together uh, through generations and through the mindset and through the relationship between sea and town. And like, there is so many thoughts behind that. We narrating voice. And I think you're right about the foreshadowing. He constantly keeps us on our toes. Ooh, now this is going to happen and the we will be uh, impacted in some way. And now this is going to happen. So uh, sometimes I was thinking, come on, don't do that. I don't have time to read anymore today. You know, and I want to know what happens. So it definitely is a trick of the author. Nate, did you want to comment again? Because you didn't take down your hand. I'm sorry, I meant to take down my hand. I will do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to be sure. Okay, and, and you know, I'm sitting here with a million questions, right? I want to hear what you think about the women's role and the way the women's role in Marcel changed and why Clara Fries can certainly be perceived as, well, the Xerxes, yes, trying to battle and beat the sea, but also a very evil person when she is saying to her son, you are dead. It's kind of like the we turns into we the dead. So I would love to see that and why the widows perceive her as such a little weakling who doesn't really understand what she's doing and she's very sharp. Plus she has a very, very good uh, advisor and she's kind of the, well, you could say the successor to Cheng Mei, the, the Chinese woman who got Albert going. So she's a very strong woman. What about that? Is she just a destructive force? So that's one question I really would like to have your views on how women are maybe perceived as the tiny little housekeepers. We're just keeping it together. And then all of a sudden she's a millionaire and a ship broker and trying to ruin the town. Any, any thoughts on that? Does Ray, you want to start? I can start, but I'm also happy to sit back and wait and give the, you know, the opportunity to someone else. Um, I just, I can quickly say, Although I love this book, I don't like the way the females are described. It's very obvious to me that this is a book written by a man and an older man. And um, sorry, I'm being very frank here, here, but it's just the women's roles to me are very much a product of um, the male world, which of course it has been until recently and still is in my opinion, um, not to be all political and stuff, but I mean, but it's just very clear that no matter what kind of woman is described, whether it's uh, um, in a brothel or a meager or very humble woman or this Clara Fries, it's she's acting within a certain role that I understand is of course culturally defined, but also I could be wrong, uh, but to me it's very, it's within the context of a male written universe. I'm just like, now it's all out there forever. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Linda? <laughs> yeah, I agree with Desiree. And to me in the book, the only breath of female fresh air was Miss Sophie. And I was thrilled to see it. I was thrilled mm -hmm. to see that she had her hair cut and went to sea as a sailor. I thought that was really wonderful. I've read a lot of uh, sea books, all of Patrick O'Brien, Horatio Hornblower, and you just don't see that. Every once in a while, you do see that a woman sneaks on board as a male and, and becomes a sailor. So I love that Miss Sophie was there. It saved it for me. Okay, so I can do a plug for a tale by Hans Christian Andersen called What the Wind Told About Valdemar Dope and His Daughters, where actually the middle daughter 
also goes to sea and dies when she falls off the mast and <laughs> is killed that way. So, but anyway, Hans Christian Andersen had that perspective. If you were a failure as a woman, you could go to sea. A woman, you know, a womanly woman who would want to get married. So it's kind of yeah. an interesting when when you're talking about stereotypes, Desiree. It's interesting that Hans Christian Andersen was definitely buying into that stereotype of okay, she was trying to be male, maybe trans back in the 1840s, and a very very different role. But you didn't answer my question. What do the rest of you think? Is Claire Fries is she evil when she yes, wants to absolutely. prevent her son from? going to sea and getting drowned and, and being lost like her husband, like everybody else around her. She is a businesswoman per se, but is she, uh, I mean, is she well, redeemed in, in her actions? Does any, did anyone think anything about her or is um, it just me? I found her very complicated and interesting. At, at, at first, I felt she just fit the story as a woman from a man's perspective, and they only see two dimensions. They're very, they see sort of a, a, a veneer of a woman, and they don't grasp any of those other things. And I don't know if it's because they don't have the capability to grasp it, or they don't want to spend the mental energy to try and grasp it. So in the mm -hmm. parts of the book, I found her interesting. And then when, as she started gaining power, Based on her background and her education and her life experiences, I felt that what she did with all that was very consistent. And, and she wasn't someone who thinks big picture and what, what, what will happen 20 years from now. She's only thinking of her small little world and how to control it. So I felt she came together as a character and I didn't necessarily see her as evil. Okay, thanks. Any other comments? Because otherwise, I want to move on because we're always. Oh, um, did you raise your hand this way? Sorry. <laughs> well, I just think it's interesting. If I, I mean, um, this woman who, when she got, she she came from very humble, poor conditions. She came from somewhere which was not Masta, a neighboring island. She got the opportunity. She went to school. She had education, and then she changed the place that she was brought to by her. Mm -hmm husband who died at sea. So it would be interesting to hear uh, Carsten Jensen, who is very left-leaning, how he reads this, because one could read it as, um, be careful what you give to uh, people coming uh, from the outside and in, and like the changes that will necessarily follow. Um, like, I don't think she's evil. She does what's right for her. Might not be right for everyone, but for her, it's the right thing. And it's just, um, but it, it would be interesting to hear his perspective on this because mm -hmm. you could, I mean, that's, this is probably putting it, you know, very black and white, but um, that is what happens when, when time changes, when people uh, uproot and go to new places, they, we bring with us something to this country. People bring things to the country they immigrate to or move to or the place they move to. And so she does what is right for her. Mm -hmm. It's true. Lori? I wonder if, um, if there's a piece of this that is really uh, about uh, money and power, um, because the reason that the, that the community is set up the way it is in the beginning of the book, where the guys have to go out and do all that, and then the women get, scrape by while they're gone, um, that's all the, the people who, who give a little bit more of, the, of a, of a, um, of, of a community of a, a society where people are getting small shares and that seems to be working and one of the things about Clara though and but we see this in a couple of the other male characters too they're going full on capitalism and capitalism I think as reflected in this book is an incredibly violent thing you know hence, hence the wars and hence mm -hmm. the military leaders who aren't really thinking about dead people they're thinking this is going to be great for the economy we've heard that in a lot of different places um, and so I, I think she's in, although I, I, I agree with, with the criticism that we could use um, a more rounded female characters and perspective in the book, I think she's in some ways um, turning that trope on, on its head a bit by being a woman, a strong capitalist business owner, 
changing the world to fit the way she, she she wants to see it. I have the power, therefore, I'm going to use it instead of I'm going to share it. Yeah, that's a very interesting point of view. And she is, she is going to hold the reins. Nate? I realize I'm speaking from the position of a man here, so I, I better be careful. But, but yeah. I, uh, Desiree nods. <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, I, I see Clara as actually a heroic figure um, and not as a, as a, you know, this kind of antagonist. I think she wants to do what's best for Mastado, what she, what she thinks is right and good and protect. I think there's something deeply maternal about, about Clara in a way that, that she wants to save what she feels like the men around her have literally destroyed. And yes, and I think what, what comes of it, of course, is more destruction, which is sad. But I think Albert is the same way. I think Albert also has these kinds of desires to protect. But I, Albert's death is, I think, just wonderfully dark, mm -hmm. humorous death. I mean, he's this great man who literally dies <laughs> frozen out on this this little jetty. Um, I think it's just it, it's a humorously tragic way to die, and I think he ends the same way, and in, in, in that Clara ends in the end. But, that I think both are struggling, battling against the sea in some way, in very different ways, but that there's a kind of yin and yang to the way that they approach things and neither of them succeed. In the end, we are all drowned, right? Uh, at least that's the way I read it. So I, I, I understand the viewpoint that Cloud does not come off as, as a, you know, this kind of wonderful female protagonist in some way, but, but I also wonder, I see something very almost mythological in the way that Albert operates and Clara operates as this kind of maternal, paternal, yin-yang kind of, kind of responses to the violence and brutality of life and neither of them ultimately succeed, so. <clears throat> and I, no, I think that's great. And, and you know, it really kind of makes me think of the boots, like, uh, like you were mentioning also, uh, okay, maybe it's magical realism, these boots. But actually, they keep his father on his feet, right? And then they keep Albert on his feet as he's freezing to death. And it's potentially a suicide because he's choosing yeah. to stay there. Because, of course, he could get out of mud, even with the boots, if he wanted to. It's like, okay, I'm done. I've had it. Now I'm ending the saga of the boots. And I think that the symbolism of the boots may be that, yes, when you have them on and they're very strong boots, you can stay in, you know, in life and alive. But at some point, you can also choose to use them to get out of life. So I think that's a very interesting kind of aside to the fact that, yes, he is unable to deal with the female um, emotions or the female responsibility or obligation or expectations of Kla. And uh, that's a, a whole different discussion, why he's unable to go in there and just have a relationship and marry her, crying out loud and, and you know, be that father figure that he is to the son, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, Khan <laughs> oh, No, no, I, I was just uh, thinking about the, the women again, and I'm going to, I don't remember all the names, but one of the, um, uh, is her name Su Chen? Yeah, Chung, yes, Chung Bay. Chen. Yeah. Even though there's a certain amount of caricature in the way that this character is presented in sexuality, she is also the one that ends up making the fortunes of, by her advice and relationship with these two men who are both very important to Clara in terms of moving her forward financially. She would not have been able to connect except for she, with this other gentleman who becomes her financial advisor, other than the fact that he also had a relationship with Su Chen. So there is somewhere in there, although maybe not in a, in a strong, uh, positive woman role, that, that the power in a lot of this finance was with this, with this woman, uh, mm -hmm. Su Chen, um, and mm -hmm. what she was able, uh, how she was able yeah. to influence these two men. And then it goes back to Carla. So that's she just- She was an I'm outsider. Saying. And that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, she was not from Marseille. She was- in Paris, right? Yes, yeah. So she was still presented. influencing, you know, it all yeah. kind of weaves together for Carla mm -hmm. and the influence really comes from this, this other woman, essentially. Definitely the money and the influence, mm -hmm. the advice, like you say, and building it up and building Albert up. And so then again, 
the only one who is actually not successful because of money she uses from men whom have taken advantage of them, uh, Clara and Zhang uh, Mei, um, whatever her name is. So the brothel lady and Clara both succeed because they have an opportunity to use money from guys who I would say used them first. But Miss Sophie, who yeah. comes from means, we have to say, she comes from means contrary to the other two ladies, but she's actually doing things without having to survive and make her way in the world because of men, mm -hmm. right? So I, I agree with you, Linda. She's uh, she's yeah. the saving grace for me too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but She's hey, not cowtowering. Can I just draw the attention to Christina, please? Because yeah. she's an example of very forward thinking of Clara when she helps her go to America to have a baby out of wedlock and actually gives her a new life. And this is Clara's good side. She builds an orphanage. She has a horrible background. She builds an orphanage. She helps not just Christina, but other women who are victims, maybe of rape, like Christina was, or actually wasn't when it turns out to be the baby of Eva. Uh, but she is helping in a very progressive way for that time. So that's also an interesting role that she's taking on herself. She would like to do good for the weak, just not for the ocean that she considers her enemy. And you know what? I have one final question because, of course, always there are a million questions. But what do you think of the stork? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's the, my the final stork. question. What is the stork, everybody? It's such a good question to end with. What does it say? Well, the stork for? was the stork was impervious to the BB shots. And the stork was flying alongside, I think it was the Nimbus. So uh, there must be some hint of hope. Mm -hmm. the, the stork, mm -hmm. because it was building its nest, it kept coming back year after year. Even when the place was shot up during the war and in shambles. Did you all see that? The stork as a symbol of new hope? coming home. It's a homecoming beacon because they say little Bluetooth with a funny name there. He says, okay, look, that's gotta be that fell. And uh, the adults say, no, 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 it can't be. It's just a stork. And then it turns out to be the stork. And I like it that he makes it come full circle because yes, Linda, I agree with you. It's a symbol of hope. Any other interpretations or Otto, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, because I was going to say which stork, because there's also the incident where they tried to shoot the stork. That's the and, same and, stork. It was the same stork. Yeah. It goes and, back and, to the same place. And, and they are <laughs> unable to, uh, to he, they never got it, you know, so, so okay. that's, that stork is, is, is uh, very significant. Mm -hmm. And that is such a great way to end this wonderful discussion. Yes, yeah, there's a good book. And if we want to also see that last line, we were dancing. We are all in a circle, right? The stork represents a circle that they all unite in towards the end and at the end of the book. And of course, if you think about that news that the Germans have surrendered and what it did to the Danes who had been occupied from April 9th, 1940 until the eve of May 4th, 1945, that was the best news ever. And everybody was out in the street dancing and burning their uh, darkening curtains and just feeling the joy of a new life beginning. So that's why I thought this was an appropriate ending for this wonderful discussion and I can't thank you enough all for being here and I can promise you that the book for February is short <laughs> and very very good <laughs> it's called The Liar and it's an existential book it's um it's absolutely wonderful it's actually uh takes place on another island so we're doing a few islands here but it's a book I can highly recommend and I'll 
see if I can find it online so you can download it um, and get it for free. And I certainly hope to see many of you again. Thank you so much for coming Thank and you. I look forward to seeing you in February. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.